argue that the way that um, community has been defined in law at present has actually adversely affected their ability to um, participate in decision-making processes um, and, and have a say when they feel that their rights are being threatened. Um, and what we're seeing happening is that um, often the capacity of individuals and smaller subgroups who are often dissenting of a majority get subsumed within the identity of a much broader community. Um, and then this is actually cemented into law. Um, and it actually becomes a tool for silencing those people who are dissenting for the, ma for the majority. So um, that's just a brief, a brief background. We're obviously still in the process of developing the paper, and so we'd be very happy for any feedback. Um, what I will do first is speak to how community has been defined in two pieces of legislation. Um, and then I'll turn to Tiani, who will look at some um, critiques in the social sciences of this term community. Um, and then he'll end off with an example from the Eastern Cape, um, which we think really illustrates the problem with how community has been defined in law um, at present. So my starting point was um, to look at two pieces of legislation, one dealing with um, land reform in South Africa, and it's called the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, which we call Epeora because it's a really clumsy name. Um, and the second one is the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, which I'll just call the Framework Act. And what I was interested in was to look at um, not just the definition of community, but do they have to look a certain way? Do they have certain requirements? What processes are entailed um, in their recognition or uh, for them to come into existence? And is the law's understanding of how communities um, exist uh, consistent with how they actually exist in practice? So first, Epeora. So um, Epeora was actually intended as a temporary measure to provide um, security of tenure or protection to land rights that hadn't been formalized um, under South African law due to historical um, discrimination. And 20 years later, um, it's still relevant. It's still uh, a law that's actually just been extended year after year after year, um, so not very temporary in the end. Um, and in Epeora, community is defined as any group or portion of a group of persons whose rights to land are derived from shared rules determining access to land held in common by such a group. And the part that I'd like to highlight um, is that, to me, the key defining factor seems to be that for a community to exist, people have to have shared rules uh, of access to land, um, and that these, these rules are informed by customary practices. Um, and these would then frame uh, relations to land, so who gets access when, um, what processes are required if you want to gain access to a piece of land, and how do you adjudicate disputes uh, that arise in, in relation to land. What's really important to note is that there's no defined margins for the scope of that community um, or its position in relation to other groupings or communities. Um, so it could either be quite uh, a large, coherent group, or it could be a small group that exists within another group. Um, and Epiro doesn't define that in any kind of way. It doesn't set any limitations on that. Um, it also doesn't seem to subsume an individual's identity into the larger group. And so Epiro still refers to a person's rights, even though those person's rights form part of a communal land um, system. And this, this definition of community is incredibly important because what it does in Epeora anyway is it invokes procedures um, for the protection of land rights when those are being threatened. And so when, before any person can be deprived of their right to communal land, um, the customary participatory decision-making um, processes under customary law have to take place. And there has to be um, a general meeting uh, where a majority of, of, of um, people who, who are rights holders uh, decide that a person could be deprived of their, of their rights to land. And these are incredibly important procedural um, requirements that are put in place by Epeora. So the definition does important work. Um, 
In interestingly, Apura also has a definition for person, which um, says that a person could include a community or part thereof. So there seems to be no conundrum in this relatively undefined group of people um, having personhood or juristic personality, being able to make decisions, having legal status, um, being able to transact. Um, and and Apura seems to find no conundrum in this. Um, there's also no restriction placed on, on who those legal acts can be exercised against. And so technically you could be a subgroup within a larger group who's exercising your Epura rights against a large group. Um, and this definition, although I won't discuss it in detail, is very similar to uh, the definitions of community under the Restitution of Land Rights Act. Um, and the Communal Property Associations Act, which is sort of part of a, a series of land reform laws that were promulgated in the 90s. The second one, um, and I'm going to start moving a bit faster, is the, the Framework Act. And this was set up to regulate traditional um, governance systems in the country um, and to provide recognition processes for leaders and communities um, and uh, traditional councils. And what's really important about the definition of community under this act is that it's explicitly linked to this concept of tradition. Uh, the Framework Act doesn't just recognize communities, it recognizes traditional communities. Um, and <laughs> the definition of traditional community isn't helpful uh, because it just references the processes in the Framework Act. So it says a traditional community is a traditional community that is recognized under this act. <laughs> And the Act sets up two processes for recognizing traditional communities. The first one um, is by way of application to the Premier of a province. Um, and the, the Premier makes an administrative decision uh, whether to <coughs> recognize a community or not, based on whether there's, and there are two requirements. The first requirement is that it must be subject to a system of traditional leadership according to customs. And the second one is that um, the community must observe a system of customary law. So the second one, in my mind, is quite akin to Apira's requirement that people have shared rules um, of access to land. So there must be some kind of normative framework informing this group of persons called a community. The second one, however, makes it very clear that there can be no traditional community without a traditional leader. Um, and so the traditional leader's recognition and existence becomes a prerequisite for the existence of the community, which is a bit bizarre. Um, from the Framework Act structure as a whole, we also know that the specific traditional leader being referred to is a senior traditional leader, uh, formerly known as a chief. And so you're, you're limiting it to one kind, a traditional leader is specifically limited to one kind of uh, leadership um, status, one level of what could be a, a much more complicated hierarchy of leadership um, within a customary law system. So the more dubious um, route and, and faster route <laughs> to be recognized as a traditional uh, community comes from the transitional mechanisms in the bill. Um, and this is in section, I mean, sorry, in the, in the Act. And this is in section 28. What section 28 does is it automatically recognizes all tribes that were recognized under the 1927 Native Administration Act, a colonial law, um, as traditional communities today. And so it's an automatic deeming provision. Um, and obviously, <laughs> obviously this is much faster. You don't have to go through the premier. There's no application process. It just happens automatically through the statutory device. And this is actually how most traditional communities recognized today have been, have gotten their recognition um, democratically or, or under the current regime. Um, which to me means that we can't separate this idea of traditional community from the idea of a tribe, which comes with a political and illegal history of its own. Um, and, and this history, hmm, okay, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, and I think that Tiani will go into that a bit more detail, but I think that that it just means that this concept of traditional community is very, very closely linked to the concept of tribe and all of the history that comes with that. And this is harmful when you're recognizing one kind of community to the exclusion of all others. 
Um, and when, as the example that Tiane uh, will speak to, when that definition becomes the exclusive way in which you can access your rights and in which you can defend your rights. Um, and, and that's why we think this definition is so important, because it gives you access to benefits, it gives you access to procedures, um, and it gives you status in law. So I'll hand over to Tiani. All right, as Minka has mentioned, I'm going to be basically look at, looking at what um, <clears throat> has come out of the social sciences in terms of um, the, co the concept of community, how it has been dealt with, and also give a case study of um, how uh, the definition of community in the law um, manifest in reality or affect uh, people's realities. Um, so basically the definition of community found in the legislation does not take uh, into consideration the complexity that has been found in the social sciences around this concept. And that actually spells out um, danger for a lot of these communities um, where these laws are applied. One of the first things that, um, I mean, you find when you look up a community in social science work, you find that actually it's undefinable. That's one of the first things that you'll come across. And it is counted as um, among the most slippery and contentious concept in the social sciences. And Creed has actually noted that though a lot has been said about community, what, it actually, what actually makes a group of people a community is often never defined. And even when it is defined, um, the definition is never agreed upon. And actually, I think in the, I think the 1950s or sometime early 19th century, I think they found about 50 def different definitions of a community. Due to the fact that um, community has acquired so many, or the concept of community has acquired so many meanings, uh, it has in fact become meaningless, and even as an analytical tool. Furthermore, you find that in practice, the concept is often romanticized and used, to, um, and used in a positive manner to invoke, to invoke an uh, unequivocal, uh, to, to invoke an unequivocal, an equivocal, an unequivocal good, and as an indicator of a high quality of life, uh, a life of, of, a, of a human understanding, caring, self, selflessness, and belonging. However, it, it has also been pointed out that actually, community or the concept of community lowers the consciousness of difference, hierarchy, and oppression, which is often invoked within groups. And this is done in an effort to naturalize and mobilize collectivity. So um, Joseph uh, cautions against romanticizing community as that will blind us from possible strategies for challenging and destroying the structures of domination and exploitation. So this is one of the key points that we're trying to make in this, um, in this paper. Or to highlight why it's important to interrogate the concept of uh, community as it is defined in the law. Furthermore, seeing that I have two minutes, so I'm gonna quickly summarize this. Uh, the concept has also been found to be violent, especially by feminist and post-structural theorists. So they found it to be violent in, in relation to racism, sexism, and violence, and even um, genocidal, genocidal violence. And I mean, one, one good example that just happened recently is um, the internal politics within the RMF movement. There was the bigger politics, but internally there was a lot of politics in terms of gender, and um, sexual orientation identities. The concept of community has also been politically, or is often politically manipulated. Uh, Thornton and, and Rampele, I mean, um, point to this. That uh, the concept is the political, is the most, is perhaps the political term. This is based on the fact that uh, in the political arena, community is used to justify a wide range of actions, uh, either, you know, from government, ranging from government projects to revolutions. So it can work both ways. And also, they also note in relation to the South African, uh, this is Thornton and Rampele, also note in relation to the South African concept, that the concept of community was used by the apartheid government to justify co-opting and appointing leaders. This is in relation to traditional leaders. And if you look at laws um, that are coming out of parliament in relation to traditional leaders um, post-94, you find actually they still function the same way. They're not so different, so nothing has changed. Even though uh, the concept of community has been criticized you find that actually it's still gaining favor and popularity in public discourse and also in academic discourse. And actually, um, um, some scholars, for example, Creed, has, called, has referred to the concept of community as a tar baby of social science, or of social analysis and cultural theory as it absorbs, as it absorbs every attempt to interrogate and problematize it. 
And someone else has called it, uh, Crean has called it, an elusive unicorn. So two reactions, basically um, recognizing these problems around this concept. There's been two reactions. One has been to either abandon it altogether because it's undefinable and no one really knows, knows what it is, but at the same time, it's popular. And however, other scholars have opted for a more nuanced view um, of the concept, recognizing that while communities um, are imagined, they are also enacted, believed in, desired, and embodied in social relations as they are lived and experienced in real ways. This is despite, this is despite the fact that not everyone is included in the imagined collective. So, running through the case study. <laughs> so basically, the case study is of two communities that um, from Kolobeni, which is on the wild coast of the Eastern Cape. Um, so actually, two villages, uh, which are Sikidi and Dajia village. So, um, so these villages, together with other villages, form um, Amadiba traditional community, which is headed by Chief Lungabaleni as a senior tra a traditional leader. And Amadiba traditional community, along with other traditional communities, together form uh, the Amambondo or Mbondo kingdom. And in 2008, um, the South African National Road agent, Sandra in short, proposed the construction of a toll road from East London to Durban, which will, would run through these communities, the land that's owned by these two villages in particular. Um, the proposal was approved by the Minister of Water and Environmental Affairs in 2010. Um, however, it was rejected by the communities, uh, by the villages together with their chief and they filed a review application challenging uh, the minister's decision to grant, um, to grant environmental authorization for the proposed uh, road. However, Sandral managed to, to pursue the chief to change his mind, and he changed his mind and granted the permission for the construction of the road. Um, however, while some of the villages in the community um, <laughs> changed their mind or their position with the chief, uh, Sikidi village and Daja village remained opposed to the construction of the toll road. Okay. <laughs> so the, the road would require the relocation of these two villages and they would lose their ancestral land and family graves and grazing land and generally their livelihoods would be, decide, would, would be disrupted. So it was on this basis that they continued uh, opposing the, the construction of the toll road. However, in 2015, Sandral filed an interlocutory um, application against these two villages. In the application, Sandral was seeking an end to the review application by challenging the local standard of the two villages based on the definition of community that is in the Framework Act, as Monica explained earlier. Essentially, the dispute in the interlocutory application related to um, the status and decision and decision-making powers of various sub-communities Within larger, community, within larger customary communities in terms of customary law, um, and also how customary communities take decisions and, how, um, and who participates in those decisions. And thus, fundamentally, and thus, fundamentally, where the rights that may be affected are held. Uh, Luck then, uh, as CLS, um, applied as amicus in the in the in the in the interlocutory application, um, and this is the following argument that was made: that the current, uh, basically, the Framework Act recognizes the identity and the status of traditional community and traditional councils at the level of traditional of senior traditional leaders, and in this case, that would be the Amadiba traditional uh, council. However, in terms of customary law systems around South Africa, in terms of customary law systems around South Africa they all recognize communities at various levels, not at just one level. Um, and in fact, all these levels historically were granted um, considerable independence. They function as independent uh, communities in relation to the broader community. So as a result, decisions and discussions and deliberations and um, all in fact happened at all levels of the community including the level of the homestead and the family. So the notion of community that is in the, legis in the legislation is in fact a colonial and apartheid distortion 
the distorting impact of colonial and apartheid legislation on the governance structure of Amambondo had the effect of creating a top-down system with an all-powerful leader at the apex. And in the process, the many lower levels of the community and governance became hidden from the official view, and which was done deliberately. Basically, the literature as well shows that actually um, sub-communities under the larger community group operate with relative independence and with governance structures that mirror almost exactly the governance structure of the larger community. Shapira has written about this in relation to Tswana communities, and Crace as well, Clifton Crace, has also written about this uh, in relation to the interaction, um, what is it? In relation to, okay, let me just read it. Uh, Clifton Crace also knows that when the Europeans in the early 1900s started asserting their authority in the Eastern Cape, they did not encounter a chief who, con who had control over his people and could claim to represent and speak for them. The people within juris his jurisdiction first and foremost paid allegiance to the chief. And um, governance was not a top-down process that could be controlled from the top. So this does not match uh, the definition of community that is in the law. And the definition of community that is in the law originate from the Bandu Authorities um, Act of 1951 which deliberately uh, focused all the power on chiefs, uh, excluding all the lower levels. There's actual um, archival evidence, which I cannot go into right now because I don't have time, which actually shows how the, the chief native commissioner um, worked to change the governance structure of the Bondo, uh, of Amambond. Okay, skipping right to the end. Therefore, um, in terms of Kashmir law, the two villages have clear legal identities and as a result, they have the same standing afforded to customary community recognized in the law. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs>